Tonight, remembering a Canadian legend, the life and legacy of Donald Sutherland. This is my job. A master of his craft. I've been watching you. And you watching me. The tributes from friends, family, and fans for an iconic actor. I think of myself as an artist, and I take it very seriously. Ordered to flee from a raging wildfire in Newfoundland and Labrador. I'm just praying for the guys that are still back there and the people that are fighting the fires. Plus, the truck driving a divide and the media outlet tied to the controversial comment. Islamophobia has no place in this city. It's called free speech. You can look it up in our Charter of Rights. Also, inside the housing crisis where renting can feel out of reach. It's easy, 24, 2500 for a two bedroom, and that's if you can find one. And how to avoid an asteroid disaster. We want to be able to get a spacecraft out there before that close encounter with the Earth. Putting the plan in place to save the planet. We're going to need more than Bruce Willis. CTV National News with Omar Sachedina reporting tonight, Morella Fernandez. Good evening. Donald Sutherland was a legendary performer, respected, revered, and tonight remembered. A Canadian who could slip into any role, and when he did, he could take you along for a ride you wouldn't soon forget. His breakout performance came in the 1970 movie MASH. Sutherland played the wise-cracking surgeon Hawkeye Pierce. Next, a health inspector in the 1978 sci-fi horror, Invasion of the Body Snatchers. In 1980, his role as a father in Ordinary People made it clear how versatile he could be. And fast forward to 2012, when the Hunger Games role as a tyrannical leader endeared him to a new generation. Tonight, CTV's Heather Wright shares the story of a man from the Maritimes who took the world stage by storm. I'm not joking. This is my job. For nearly seven decades, Donald Sutherland captivated audiences around the world with his voice, his presence, his charisma. Starring in more than 190 films and TV shows from Animal House to MASH to The Hunger Games. Contain it. I think of myself as an artist and I take it very seriously. Donald McNichol Sutherland was born in St. John, New Brunswick in 1935. At 14, he landed his first job as a news correspondent for CKBW, the local radio station. He studied engineering and drama at the University of Toronto before moving to London to pursue an acting career. I told my father that what I wanted to be was an actor, which was kind of silly because I had, I'd never even seen the theatre. Sutherland's big break came in 1967 with The Dirty Dozen. Where are you from, son? followed by more military films like Kelly's Heroes and MASH. Well, off screen, he became a vocal activist, protesting the war in Vietnam. There's a particular savvy in that, isn't there? More recently, Sutherland attracted a new generation of fans, playing President Snow in The Hunger Games and starring alongside his son Kiefer in the 2016 Western Forsaken. Though he spent much of his life in the United States, Sutherland says his father was a proud Canadian. Uh, he's led such an extraordinary life. He's traveled a, a, a great deal, but I think always goes back to kind of the Maritimes kind of creating the root of who he is. In a statement today, Kiefer Sutherland said his father was never daunted by a role, good, bad or ugly. He loved what he did and did what he loved, and one can never ask for more than that. A life well lived. Often considered one of the most talented actors to never win an Academy Award, Sutherland was presented with an honorary Oscar in 2017. I wish I could say thank you to all of the characters that I've played. A companion of the Order of Canada, today the Prime Minister, offered his condolences to the Sutherland family. He was a man with a strong presence, uh, a brilliance uh, in... Um, in his craft. Donald Sutherland leaves behind his wife, five children and grandchildren. He was 88. Heather Wright, CTV News, Toronto. The tributes are still pouring in tonight. Director Ron Howard called Sutherland one of the most intelligent, interesting and engrossing film actors of all time. Actor Michael Douglas says, what a lovely, talented and curious man. And from actor Helen Mirren tonight, 
I will miss his presence in the world. The call came in quick last night for residents of Churchill Falls in Labrador. They had 45 minutes to pack up and get out as a wildfire closed in on the community. Many work in the nearby power plant, and with the fire doubling in size today, they're wondering how long they'll be out. Here's CTV's Garrett Berry. Another night in limbo for hundreds of evacuees from Churchill Falls. I mean, I've lived in the house many years, so I mean, that's, that's home. Everything we own is there. As wildfire smoke billows through the town, fire crews and four water bombers fight to keep the flames away and on the other side of the mighty Churchill River. Really bad. I hadn't seen it that bad. And it blocked out the sun and the smoke was coming right into town. Help will soon be on the way from other provinces. And in Newfoundland and Labrador, officials today ordered a fire ban, saying they can't risk another incident. We want to make sure that we don't have... Uh, subsequent uh, other threats uh, that could uh, dilute efforts in, in fighting the fire in, in Churchill Falls. So please do not uh, light or any fires uh, across the province right now. Through thunder and lightning, about 750 people evacuated. The majority went to Goose Bay and found accommodation with friends or family. Complete strangers. I saw them lined up here in the parking lot where I'm actually now when I'm doing this call with you uh, and just said hi. Uh, would you like a place to stay? Why don't you come back to my home? We'll take good care of you. The fire here, one of seven, burning now across Labrador. A few dozen people are still in Churchill Falls to keep its hydro plant running. Uh, feeling a bit nervous and exhausted, but uh, I'm just praying for the guys that are still back there that are keeping the plant going, keeping the lights on, and the people that are fighting the fires. Churchill Falls is also a major exporter of power to Quebec. Some 15% of that province's annual energy needs is supplied through this one station. So that is a, another concern that officials are having to manage. There's a number of reach outs and coordination um, with our, our, our teams, our, our colleagues in Quebec. So um, that's well in hand with regards to their ability to prepare. For residents, no change on the horizon. Tonight's update from firefighters says they expect the evacuation order to stay in place for at least another day or two. Garrett Barry, CTV News, St. John's. It feels like there's no escape from the heat across eastern Canada. It's been simmering again in Ontario, Quebec, and the Maritimes, courtesy of that heat dome. CTV Sarah Plowman now on the extreme weather, cutting school days short and disrupting other daily routines. Today's school assignment was head home and hydrate. It felt super hot. By lunch, classrooms were too hot. Schools don't have air conditioning, um, and heat stroke in kids is terrifying. A heat dome trapping warm air over eastern Canada set off another day of warnings. A Bathurst, New Brunswick, I mean, had a temperature of 30, 38 degrees for a high the other day. Minimum temperatures at night have been uh, above uh, 25, 26 degrees. In Toronto, hundreds of schools have no air conditioning. A similar story in New Brunswick. A few have AC, most do not. In Quebec, one school called in the fire department. We have a lot of people in my class, so sometimes when we're all together, it gets, it gets really hot. Some bakeries stayed closed or shut early. I think today we reached about 60 degrees in the kitchen. In Ottawa, the heat is slowing down commutes. The light rail transit system reduced its speed so tracks don't expand. When they expand uh, to a point um, that creates additional stress on the rail, and it actually can, can bend the rail slightly. In Fredericton, volunteers pass out the gift of hydration. It's very hot. It is very hot nowadays. So it, it is our duty to do something social. Doctors say what makes this heat wave particularly concerning is how early it's happening. But because this is happening very early in the summer months, uh, our bodies are not yet used to, to dealing with that heat. They're not acclimatized, is, is what we typically say. Even once this eases, people should be prepared. A climatologist says this could be the first of what might be a long, hot summer. Morella. All right, Sarah, thanks for the update. A tropical storm has claimed four lives in Mexico. Two of the victims are children said to have suffered electric shocks while riding a bike in the rain. Alberto has now been downgraded to a tropical depression. It triggered flash flooding in the interior. The impact also being felt in Texas, where coastal areas are being battered by strong winds and flooding. Fingers are crossed that Calgary's water main problems will be fixed in time for the start of the stampede, but here's the fine print. 
This is a best case estimate at this particular point in time. And it means that work could be done as soon as July 5th. The work in and around a massive feeder main is about halfway done. City residents have been living with water restrictions since the start of the month. We have an update tonight on a hate crimes investigation in Toronto. A right-wing media outlet says it owns the advertising truck, displaying what is described as an anti-Muslim message. CTV's John Woodward tonight with a surprising turn of events. The van appears to be driving on University Avenue in Toronto next to Ontario's legislature. It's showing pictures of Muslims in prayer and asking, is this Yemen? Is this Syria? Is this Iraq? followed by the words, wake up Canada, you are under siege. A message panned by Muslim groups, police vowed to investigate it, and Toronto's mayor said it was deeply worrisome. I've asked other levels of government to join me in condemning this very hateful message. I've got some breaking news. It's by mid-afternoon, Ezra Levant of the right-wing media organization Rebel News admitted the truck was his. It's called free speech, you can look it up in our Charter of Rights. The messaging, he said, from a group called Canadians Opposed to the Occupation of Our Streets and Campuses, a nod to protests, including the encampment at the University of Toronto. A group by that name didn't seem to have an online footprint. Barbara Perry of the Centre for Hate, Bias and Extremism said the messaging seemed inspired by an anti-immigration conspiracy theory and said it's arguable that the truck's messaging could have broken Canadian law against incitement to hatred. I think it was that last piece we are under siege, that really tipped it for me. I mean, that is really a blatant indication or suggestion that uh, we're under attack, that we are under threat from Muslims specifically. The truck's message came at a time hate crimes are rising fast as Israel's war in Gaza prompts division in Canada. Toronto businessman Mohamed Faki had offered a $25,000 reward for information leading to who was behind the truck, something Levant called a bounty. I've hired a lawyer and we're obviously going to fight because this is still Canada, not Gaza. Levant said in order to pay those legal fees and avoid two years in jail, he's going to raise money from his supporters. John Woodward, CTV News, Toronto. A lack of funds is what is keeping most renters from owning a home. A new snapshot suggests many need to hand over more than half of their paychecks for a place to live. CTV's Andrew Johnson with a renter's reality check tonight. On a beautiful Thursday in Vancouver, the outlook from renters isn't exactly sunny. And I haven't really been looking around lately, but... When I was last year, holy crap, it was bad. Rent prices have skyrocketed as the country struggles through a post-pandemic housing crisis, experts say, is also fueled by immigration. According to a new report from Royal LePage, the financial reality of putting a roof over your head is particularly bleak in B.C. 27% of renters in Vancouver are spending more than half of their net income on paying the rent. In Toronto, 19% are forking over more than 50% of their paycheck. One in 10 Montrealers are in that position. The national average is 16%. The target is uh, roughly a third of your income is sort of deemed affordability. Experts say ultra-low rental vacancy is part of the problem, driven by how hard it is right now to get into the market as a buyer. We have a lot of renters who really want to get into ownership, uh, but until either rates come down and or prices fall, uh, it's going to be a while. As for that traditional dream of one day owning a home, for most renters, it's not happening anytime soon. The survey reports 27% of renters in Canada do plan to buy a property in the next two years, but the vast majority, 69%, do not. Just over half cited insufficient income as a reason for their decision. The down payment is going to be that biggest hurdle, saving up enough money to actually purchase the home. But younger renters apparently aren't giving up. The survey shows the people with the biggest intent to move into the buying market are millennials, people in their 30s, who may also be ready to start a family. Andrew Johnson, CTV News, Vancouver. WestJet mechanics have called off a strike that would have seen workers walk off the job tonight. The union will now head back into talks with the airline. Around 50 flights were cancelled as WestJet prepared for the job action, but no flights should be impacted moving forward. Coming up, kicking up the competition.
Cheering on Canada, vying for soccer success. Plus, NASA's plan to avert an asteroid collision. Canada kicked off a new chapter in soccer history tonight with its first game at the major Copa America tournament. Canadian fans brought their A game. A sea of red and white in Atlanta where fans belted out the national anthem in a show of pre-game pride. On the pitch, Canada played one of the world's best, Lionel Messi, and FIFA number one ranked Argentina. Canada had a great chance near the end of the first half, but was denied. Argentina would open the scoring in the second half and then would add another one in the final minutes of the game, holding on to beat Canada 2-0. CTV's Adrian Gobriel is with fans at home, sizing up Canada's overall chances. Soccer fans across Canada and right here in Toronto's Little Italy have been soaking in all the action since the Euros kicked off last week. And today, they got a double helping of football fun, getting to cheer on their favourite European side and then pull on the red and white as Team Canada took to the pitch against the World Cup champs Argentina and Lionel Messi, who's appearing in his seventh Copa Americas. And football insiders believe that this version of the Canadian men's team are poised to make some noise against some of the world's best. Canada are the upstarts. Canada are the team that the world is very, very curious about. So this is a fantastic stage for them. And as we saw in the two tune-up games against the Netherlands and against France, two of the best teams in Europe, two of the teams favored to win Euro 2024 right now, uh, Canada can hold their own. So how long they can do that at, in Atlanta is what everyone's very curious to see. Um, but this team is, is so much better than the team that went to Qatar. Canada's journey at the Copa Americas rolls on this coming Tuesday when they take to the pitch against Peru and they'll face off against Chile in the final group stage match on June 29th. What a time to be a Canadian soccer or football fan. Adrian Gobriel, CTV News, Toronto. Straight ahead, a rapper's rap sheet. How this celebrity ended up in custody. Another music celebrity found himself behind bars this week. Grammy-nominated hip-hop star Travis Scott got arrested after a scuffle on a yacht in Miami. CTV's Allison Bamford has details. Tell me, is you still love? Another touring musician tied up with the law. Rapper Travis Scott arrested for trespassing and disorderly intoxication after police were called to a yacht fight in Miami Beach. Officers reportedly witnessed Scott yelling at passengers and could sense a strong smell of alcohol on the 33-year-old's breath. They're misdemeanors and not felonies. Scott, whose legal name is Jacques Berman Webster, spent about four hours in jail overnight. Released this morning on a $650 bond, police records show, admitting to officers he'd been drinking, saying it's Miami. Shortly after his release, the rapper posted on X, LOL, and photoshopped his mugshot in a story on Instagram. Travis's fans, I think that they're going to follow him no matter what. And this small incident of him drinking on a boat and yelling profanities is not going to stop them. The rapper saw his most musical success in 2018 with his album Astro World, and last year earned his 10th Grammy nomination for the album Utopia. His arrest comes just days after police charged pop star Justin Timberlake with impaired driving. Timberlake pleaded not guilty and is due back in court next month. It is a good reminder. You're not above the law. You, you can be Justin Timberlake and if you're driving drunk, you're going to get arrested. Uh, and you can be Travis Scott and, and if you're acting disorderly. Uh, and, and trespassing on a, on a yacht, you're going to get arrested. Timberlake is in the middle of a tour while Scott is preparing for his, slated to begin next week. If found guilty, their offenses could come with jail time, legal experts say, but in both cases, it will most likely be worked down to some kind of fine, probation, or community service. Allison Bamford, CTV News, Regina. It was a guilt-free night of fun for a 91-year-old woman from Saskatoon. Snoop Dogg gave her a night she won't soon forget. 
Phyllis Ostman met the rapper prior to his show after a local radio station heard she was a huge fan and got her tickets, a limousine, and the backstage meetup. Phyllis says she likes Snoop Dogg because he's such a nice fellow. Or even told Snoop gave her a kiss. After the break, coming down to Earth. The preparations for a threat from space. It may sound like the stuff out of movies, but an asteroid hurtling towards the Earth is something real-life scientists are preparing for at NASA. They're refining the plan because in a few short years, a space rock could come quite close. Here's CTV's Joy Melvin. In about five and a half years, a massive asteroid named Apophis, after the Egyptian god of chaos, will pass so close to the Earth, we'll be able to see it in the sky. And that has NASA scientists on high alert. We want to be able to get a spacecraft out there uh, weeks to months uh, to uh, get a look at uh, Apophis uh, before that, uh, that close encounter uh, with the Earth. Scientists working with global partners carried out asteroid threat exercises back in April to figure out if a potential planet killer is headed our way and how the world would cooperate to safeguard Earth. Yeah, we're going to need more than Bruce Willis. We're going to need actual real scientists. And, and frankly, uh, with every year and every experiment, especially the double asteroid redirect test, which was so successful, I really believe that astronauts or, or the space scientists are figuring this stuff out. Press it. Unlike in the movies, NASA has been working on tools and technology to tackle such a threat and coordinate an international disaster response. Two years ago, the double asteroid redirection test, known as the DART spacecraft, smashed into an asteroid to knock a massive space rock off its gravitational course. And it worked. All right. That's a pretty big deal for all of us on Earth. NASA hopes to use the same tested technique so we don't go the way of the dinosaurs, wiped out by a massive meteor millions of years ago. Apophis is the closest thing we know about to an asteroid that could really give us a bad day. This thing would wipe out a city no problem. But fortunately, just luck, it's not going to hit us. It's just going to come close. NEO surveyor mission. NASA says it's developing a new telescope to help find and identify asteroids as part of its planetary defense mission on track for 2027. So we'll know what's coming. Joy Malvin, CTV News, Washington. That's a wrap on the day. Thanks for sharing your time with us. For all of us here at CTV National News, good night.